great to be back on campus. I uh, come from God's frozen people up in Michigan, and when we flew out, there was snow all over the ground, and here I am, the first day of spring, and it actually looks like spring. I see buds on the trees, and I am loving being back here on campus, along with my wife, Cheryl. It is such a joy to be back, and we are thankful for God's faithfulness and how good God is to us all every day. God answers so many prayers, and he continues to work in our hearts for his glory. I'm thankful for uh, many blessings and answers to prayer. And uh, I've shared before this story, I've never forgotten it because I uh, thank God for answered prayer in my own life of the, the two guys who got talking at church, the pastor and the deacon. And the pastor said to the deacon, you know, I've got a parakeet, and it's really spiritual. He, uh, he all the time is saying, let's pray, let's pray. And the deacon said, that's funny, I've got, <laughs> I've got a parakeet, and the only thing he can say is, let's kiss, let's kiss. Well, they got to talk, they said, let's get the two parakeets together. Maybe, you know, your parakeet can rub off on mine, the deacon said, and he'll become a little more spiritual. So sure enough, they got them together, put them in the same cage, and pastor's parakeet, he, he says it, he says, you know, let's pray, let's pray, and then the deacon's parakeet says, let's kiss, let's kiss, and then the pastor's parakeet says, at last, my prayer's been answered. <laughs> and God does answer prayer. Uh, I remember as a high school student, you know, praying, Lord, where do you want me to go? I know you want me to serve you in some way. Where do you want me to go to train? And I visited different Christian campuses and visited Bob Jones University, and God just laid it on my heart. This is the place you need. <laughs> you need to be here. I had a lot of questions. Why do they have these rules? For everything, there was a reason. It was to help students to grow and to develop discipline. And I just realized I needed to be here in this place. And uh, what wonderful years. Uh, 1965, I graduated and then came right here, uh, worked on my uh, degree in Bible and then stayed on for a master's. And uh, during that time, I got another prayer answer because I'd been taught growing up in a Christian home that from an early time, you ought to start praying about your life partner. That next to salvation, uh, probably the most life-impacting decision you'll ever make is the decision about a life partner. And uh, I've been given that good advice that uh, you ought to run as fast as you can for God. And when it comes time to marry, look around and see who's running next to you. And so when that time came in my life, I was here on this campus and I looked around and I uh, north met south. I saw a gal from Florida and uh, God brought us together, the girl that God made for me for a lifetime. And I'm so thankful through her life, the blessings God has brought into my life. And then the things that happened in my life during those six years here on campus, uh, blessing after blessing after blessing that God has brought because of his faithfulness. And so I'm, I'm so thankful for the faithfulness of God to work in our lives and to direct us in his paths of righteousness for our lives. And I think of the fact that God uses weak vessels. Uh, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that God chooses to glorify himself through clay vessels, imperfect, flawed sinners that we all are, but when by grace we come to repent of our sin and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and then begin that faith walk of learning not only to be saved by grace through faith, but to walk by grace through faith. Looking to Jesus every day in a daily growing intimate relationship, God works in our lives. He is there, he is faithful, and he continues the work that he has begun. Now, as I look back and think about my own life and coming here to Bob Jones, even though I came from a good family, and a family that gave me a lot of good training. I think back on the fact that my life, if graphed spiritually, would somewhat look like this. I'd go off to a Christian camp and really draw near to God, and so there'd be a spike up. Then I'd come home, and as far as living it out on an ongoing basis, that graph would crash. <laughs> then maybe we'd have revival meetings in our church, and the graph would go back up. And so kind of the spiritual pilgrimage of my life in my high school years was 
an up and down graph. And I think of the fact that then as God allowed me to come here to a Christian university where there was ongoing training and chapels and Bible classes and uh, godly friends and just an environment that encouraged me. I look back and I certainly have not arrived. I've realized that for a lifetime it'll be a process of a daily walk with God. But I look back and realize that during those years here, God began to work in my life and help me to see a bigger picture, that Christ not only died on the cross for my sins as my Savior, but that indeed He is my Lord. He is the one that must and should direct my life every day. And then He is my very life. I don't live the Christian life for Christ. He lives that life through me. And so coming back to the cross, back to Jesus daily, and acknowledging him by faith is my savior, my Lord, and my life. Up till then, the graph could have been like this. And also the overall graph could have been up and downs, but not necessarily a consistent path upward. But then through those disciplines and those decisions made and those times of growth and grace that God planted in my heart during these years here at Bob Jones, I look back and I... I can look back into God's glory and say, I see a steady graph upward. Yes, there's still ups and downs. I'm still human. My emotions go up and down. I don't always do what's right. But looking to Jesus daily, I see a progression. That there, though there are ups and downs, the graph is going upward toward Christ-likeness. And I know that there's going to be a need for growth in that until the day I go home to heaven. But that is what I desire for my heart. And I believe that's what you desire for your heart in life by choosing to be here in a Christian university. And so that, that brings me to the topic that I'd like to preach on today, and that is maintaining your soul as a leader in ministry. Maintaining your own soul as a leader in ministry. You know, whenever you get on the airplane to travel commercially, uh, you've heard the little instructions. They always run through it at the beginning. And they talk about how if uh, uh, the need comes... The, oxygen mask will fall from the sky, no, from uh, above you there, and then you're supposed to get your own mask on first before trying to help anyone else. Well, you think it through, yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of foolish for you to be trying to help somebody else and your own oxygen supply isn't there, and then you pass out, now you're part of the problem instead of part of the solution. And I think of the fact that as believers in Christ, God wants us to have a steady flow of spiritual oxygen in our own life so that we can be a blessing to others. And this is the plan then that God has for us. And all of us, as we know, according to Ephesians 4, are called to ministry. That is, Ephesians 4 talks about the pastors and the evangelists and so forth, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So whatever our vocational calling is, Every born-again Christian has a calling to serve God, to do ministry. Our whole life is a living letter. Our whole life is a living sacrifice left here by God, redeemed, and then commissioned to ministry. And so that's what I'd like for us to zero in on today, is how do we keep that spiritual oxygen flow going in our life daily? And then for a lifetime, so that by God's grace, as God would see fit, he can use our life, each of us individually, in the place where he puts us, to the maximum for his glory. I read a little story from a book entitled The Game Plan by Joe Dallas. And in that book, the author, Joe, spoke about a man that he had worked with earlier in his life. The man's name was Robert. And he said of Robert that he was a, an amazing, gifted man. He had insight, he had passion, he had astonishing charisma. And he first met him when they were both young men. He met him in a Bible study. And uh, this guy could teach and preach and communicate with people uh, with unusual skills. And he asked Joe, the author of the book, to come on the staff of this brand new church that was a startup. Well, within three years, a little home Bible study grew into radio television ministry. Uh, they were having rallies with over a thousand people coming and money was flowing in. And this man to whom he was drawn uh, went from kind of a, a humble, uh, funny guy, 
uh, to a flamboyant, bossy guy. And he started treating the staff uh, just without sensitivity. Uh, offerings came in, but they were unaccounted for. And uh, this pastor, Pastor Robert, his lifestyle just got more and more extravagant. And as time went on, Joe realized that things weren't right. But he was scared to death to go say anything because he knew that, that the pastor would chop his head off if he came to him with anything that would appear to be a constructive uh, criticism uh, uh, for a helpful uh, change that would be needed. And so finally, he just left and left the staff and quietly went into something else. In this book, he shared the account that about 20 years later, this man, this Pastor Robert, died of AIDS contracted during an anonymous sexual encounter uh, while he was still in the pulpit. And it didn't really surprise the rest of the staff, but no one had the courage to speak up. And I think of the fact that as we study our Bibles, we realize that there were good people who started off well that failed to maintain their own soul relationship with God with great tragedy and consequence uh, affecting people around them. I think in the Bible of Samson and the failure in his life to look to God. I think of David and how he did look to God and ran so well for God but had that season in his life where he got his eyes off the Lord, failed to maintain his soul, and oh, the negative impact on his own life and the lives of others. I think of Demas in the Bible who forsook serving God having loved this present world. Well, how do we do it? How do we maintain our soul? I'd like to give you seven essentials for maintaining your soul. And then I'd like to encourage us, as we think about this, to apply those things into our lives right now while you're a student here on campus. Apply those principles for maintaining your soul. Do your part and then trust God to do his part. Turn in your Bible, if you would, to a familiar passage, Psalm 1. And then for those of you who are really uh, quick with your fingers, I'll have you also turn over to John 15 and put a little marker there. And if you are really fast, put a marker in 2 Peter 1. And then for those few that can fly through four passages, put a marker in Romans 12, all right? Now, you say, how do these passages all tie together? Well, that's what I want to unfold for you as I have meditated on God's word. These are four passages. The, the teaching of the psalmist in the Old Testament. The teaching of Jesus in John 15. Uh, the teaching of Peter in uh, 1 Peter 2, or first, uh, 2 Peter 1. And then the teaching of Paul in Romans 12. Key passages. But in all of these passages, I see a common progression of essentials for maintaining our soul. And so let's look at it. First of all, understanding God's plan for success. God wants to bless our life. He wants to use us to his own glory. The first essential flows out of Psalm 1, and I'll use that kind of as our foundation passage and then uh, kind of highlight it from other passages. The first essential is separation, separation. And my daddy taught us Psalm 1 on vacation. We go on family vacation, we memorize a passage of scripture. So I did that with our, our sons. And with our four sons, we'd, when we had a special time away or whatever, we'd try to memorize some scripture. And so we would memorize Psalm 1 with the motions. Of course, this is when they were little boys. So bear with me, okay? These are some of the, the motions that we put into this, and you can follow along in your Bible, but we would, with, with our sons, we'd say, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now here's the very first principle, separation. And it's interesting, as you study the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, Psalms and Proverbs, both of them in chapter one in their introduction to the whole book of wisdom on how do you live life, start off with this same concept. They start off with the fear and reverence and respect for God. Such fear and reverence and respect for God that you then choose to turn away from that which is wrong. 
That's where it all starts. It starts with personal separation in your own heart. Follow along with me as you think about it. The psalmist is saying, you're going to be blessed. You're going to have a happy, fulfilled life if you choose to not walk or stand in sinful ways or sit with scornful people. If you will start off here, you're at the starting point. You're at base one of what it takes to maintain your soul. Nothing will destroy the maintenance program of your own spiritual life like unconfessed, unrepented sin. That's where it all begins. That's so key in each of our lives. And God will test us on these principles. When I first came to Bob Jones, I came with a, another friend who'd been a close friend all through high school from my own hometown. And he was a fun guy to be with. Good athlete, great personality just not real spiritual. And there were things he'd go do, I wouldn't go do with him. But he came here, he got right into sports and excelled at sports. But as soon as we got here, I couldn't help but notice that he gravitated to a particular uh, friendship circle. And as I kind of, because we were friends, I met his friends. And I just realized, his friends wanted to always do things on the sly. They wanted to do things not in accordance with the authority that God had established here. And so they would sneak around and do things. And it just became evident to me that my close friend I'd done a lot of things with all through high school on campus, he was moving toward a crowd and with a crowd. And they were fun people. They were fun to be with, but their bent was the wrong way. And you know, I had to make a tough choice my freshman year. And that is, I wasn't going to write Jim off, that was his name, and just never talk to him. I'd still always be a friend to him, but I realized I can't any longer be close friends with him because he's going a different direction than I am. And it was a hard thing. I'd been active in our youth group, in our church. I had lots of friends, and you know, here on a big campus, I felt lonely because one of my closest friends was just going in a different direction than I could go. But it was good for me, and it drove me back to my Bible and to realizing, well, Jesus has to be my best friend. And if I don't have any other friend in the whole world, he's enough. And that's what I, I, I prayed that God would help me to, to love Jesus, even though I was missing the closeness that I had once had with, with Jim. Well, as the years went by, Jim didn't stay long at Bob Jones University. And years later, he talked to me and he said to me, he said, Dan, you know, when I was down at Bob Jones University, I grew up in a Bible-believing church. I knew all the words. I said I was a Christian. I wasn't a Christian. He said, I wasn't right with God. He said, I ended up leaving Bob Jones. I ended up selling drugs on the street. I ended up with a price on my head uh, with other suppliers of the drugs. And finally... After wasted years, I came to the end of myself, and I repented of my sin, and I trusted Christ, and I'm a born-again Christian now. And I looked back, and I just said, thank you, God. As a freshman in college, I, I didn't understand all that was going on spiritually. I just knew he was going in a different direction. But what a fool I would have been had I followed my friend. There were emotional ties. There was a pull there. But what a fool I would have been because I would have been following an unsaved friend right down the wrong path. And it was only the grace of God that helped me to make that choice. The very first step for maintaining your soul is separation. And sometimes it's costly. Sometimes it hurts. But by God's grace, we need to ask God to give us the grace to say, Lord, I am willing to be separated to you and from anyone or anything that leads me away from you. I pray every one of us will have that insight to embrace the essential of separation. Now, I find this same principle flowing throughout the Bible carried over then from the Old Testament into the New Testament. John 15, 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father's the husbandman. You see, a wise believer begins to discern that there is no other source for joy and life than Jesus. He is the true joy. 
And when we're pulled toward other paths that promise us joy and fulfillment, outside of God's grace and will, it's a deception. Second Peter 1, Peter says there, diligently add to your faith virtue. What's the very first thing that we're to add once we're saved? Once we come to believe in Jesus as our Savior, the very first thing he lists is virtue. What is that? Moral uprightness. See, the whole idea here is our commitment to moral excellence, to say no to sin and no to doubtful things in our life. That's foundational to the spiritual maintenance of our soul. Paul carries the same thing through in Romans chapter 12. Verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Here's the principle. We're not to be conformed to the world. It only it makes sense that if God is holy, and indeed he is, then followers of God and Jesus are called to holy lives, which means a heart commitment that I want to be like Jesus. So keep short accounts with God. Keep short accounts with God by confessing and forsaking sin daily. Let God, not your culture, define sin. As we look at the scripture, what do we find sin is defined as, well, the Ten Commandments, of course, but then it goes all the way down to the issues of the heart, doesn't it? Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's maidservant, or manservant, ox, or donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. In other words, that we would come to that point where we say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord over the desires of my heart. What I think about, what I desire in my heart, I want to be accountable to you, and I want to desire what you want for my life. Well, the second essential, the first being uh, separation, is saturation. Look back with me at Psalm 1. But his delight, and we teach our children this, you know, get the smile on your face. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. All right? So we were trying to get that principle. What are we going to do? We're going to look into God's word daily and let God's word saturate our soul. You see, if you put something out, you've got to replace it with something or you'll be a vacuum and you'll get sucked right back into the very thing you put out. When I chose to say, I'll still love Jim and pray for him, but I can't be a close friend to him, it left a vacuum in my heart. And I was driven, even on a busy campus, to look to Jesus. Because in my heart, I had come across that verse in Proverbs, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And that psalm became applied in my personal life to say, you know, I believe for me that's Jesus. That's who God wants to be my friend. My best friend must be Jesus. And so we saturate with scripture. And this is the principle then that is taught by Jesus in the John 15 passage. He goes on to say in John 15, 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto me. You see, it's the word of God that cleanses our, our hearts, our minds, our thinking. It's the word of God, the written word, that reveals to us the living word, Jesus. Peter carries on the same theme in 2 Peter 1. He says, diligently add to your faith virtue or moral uprightness and to virtue knowledge. And so it is that after virtue comes the moral uprightness, uh, or, or the moral uprightness, com then comes the knowledge. If my heart's not committed to do what's right, I can become more and more educated, but I'm just more and more an educated sinner. But if my heart is given over to Jesus to be separated unto him, then knowledge takes root and brings blessing in my life. So Paul carries the same theme. Romans 12. Don't be conformed to the world. That's the negative. You put that out, but then put in. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is God's plan. Separation, saturation. Make it the habit of your day to spend quality time in God's word. Not as a luxury, but as an essential. You know, most of us make sure we get our three meals in, if not more. And... We take care of our bodies physically. Take care of your soul. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God, God's mouth. God challenged me 
yes, I should read the Word of God, but I realized I need to get something out of it. And for me, it'd be like water running through a sieve. You've got a clean sieve, but I wasn't retaining much. And so God started laying on my heart. Get a goal. If you shoot for nothing, you'll hit it every time. Get a goal. Quality time in the Word for an intimate relationship with Jesus. For me, God laid on my heart. Start reading the proverb for the day. I started that back when I was here at the university. I've continued it throughout my life. I've never gotten past Proverbs. I need that daily wisdom. Read a psalm a day. And then read one to three chapters through the Bible. That was a goal. Now, you say, Pastor, do you hit it every day? No. Sometimes I get part of that in. Sometimes I read and I don't get to journal. But you know what my goal is? My goal is to hear from God through his word. And then to talk to God in prayer as a lifestyle. And I want to get something from the word of God in a meaningful way. And so as I journal and write something down that I get from the proverb, write something down that I got from the psalm, write something down, down that I got from my chapters through the Bible, journal it. That writing tends to concrete thought, and it helps me to meditate in the scripture and to internalize it and to personalize it. And I would urge you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Have a plan every day for saturating yourself in the word of God. Get a game plan that'll work for you. If you miss a day, pick right back up because your overall goal is not just to read the Bible. Your overall goal is to hear from God in your soul daily. Saturation is so essential. Now, the third essential is supplication. Supplication. That is lifting up your heart to God in prayer. Back to the Psalm passage. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Now here's a beautiful picture. His leaf also shall not wither. I love this picture. His leaf also shall not wither. I love the, the uh, complex process that I don't understand, but I read about it and I love God for it, uh, called photosynthesis. And that's where uh, this complex process with carbon dioxide and water and certain or inorganic salts, they're converted into carbohydrates by green plants. And they are engineered by God to use energy from the sun and then chlorophyll. And this process takes place. And when scientists want to figure out how to create more efficient storage uh, for solar power, where do they go? They go to God and they study the master designer, how did God engineer these, all these processes to take place? Well, that's what God does spiritually for us. That is, you think about it. As you separate yourself from what's wrong, saturate yourself with what's right, God's thinking, God's heart, God's mind, and then you lift your heart up toward God in prayer. It's like those leaves, the son of God's Holy Spirit energizes you and strength comes into your life. Strength and blessing comes into the lives of others. This process of supplicating, it's where we get our strength. It's how God sustains us every day. It is an essential for maintaining our soul. And I see this beautiful picture here. The leaf doesn't wither, why? The leaf is lifted up toward heaven where the sunlight then in God's wonderful process creates food for plants and animals, creates life, creates energy. God creates spiritual energy in you as you lift up your soul to God in prayer. It's a wonderful relationship. Jesus teaches the same thing. The John 15 passage. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, verse 7, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. What an amazing promise. Prayer. Prayer is essential. John 15, 16. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Miracles do happen. Uh, God will lead you to that right life partner. God will lead you to that right vocation. He will lead you to that right location. When impossible things flood in on you and it looks like there is no way out, Lift up your heart to God, and God will make a way when there is no other way. God answers prayer. Supplication, it is the source of your spiritual strength. Well, miracles happen, and Jesus taught it, Peter taught it, 
I see that in the principle of the add-ons there, where he says diligently add, and he talks about adding to knowledge temperance. Now, how many of us, if honest, would say, boy, I've got some areas that I struggle with that I know I need self-control with, but I just don't have the self-control that I ought to have. <laughs> and what does it throw you back to? Prayer. You're humble before God, and you say, God, I don't even have the desire to do what's right, but give me the right desire. I don't have the power to do what's right, but give me the power. Self-control is very closely connected to our prayer life as we lift up our heart to God for strength that we don't have, but that God can and will supply. James talks about this same principle where he says, you have not because you ask not. Why are we suffering and so weak? Well, we don't ask. We don't come to God. And Romans carries the same principle in chapter 12 where it talks all of the gifts is being energized by grace. And so I would encourage all of us, ask God for grace every day. When sin comes in our lives, deal with it immediately. Confess it and forsake it. Ask God to help us to deal with the idols of our heart, idols of the love of improper pleasure, or the love of possessions that maybe it's not God's timing or will, the love of position or pride or control for selfish reasons. Ask God to root those desires out, change those desires, replace them with a desire to love and worship God. And spend time every day in prayer. I love the little acrostic. Many of you use it. P-R-A-Y. One of my favorite things is to read God's word, the saturate, jot down a few devotional thoughts, and go for a prayer walk. And, you know, springtime is a whole lot more fun for an outdoor prayer walk than winter in Michigan, I'll guarantee you. And I love to take those little devotional thoughts and just go for a walk and talk to God. Prayer is just communicating out of our heart with God and spend time praising God. Well, it's not hard to do when you're outdoors because you're surrounded with his creation. You know, I'm enjoying the new technologies and I love high definition TV. Man, that's great. Wish we'd had that a long time ago. I got to thinking, you know, God equipped every one of us with high definition cameras. We've got them, our eyes. Every day we walk out in God's creation and guess what? We don't see it in a flat screen without high def, and we don't see it in black and white. We see it in color and high def. The creation of God, the trees, the mountains, the rivers, everything around us. And it's wonderful, it'll refresh your soul. Uh, there's indications even from secular people that getting out in the creation of God restores your soul because your mind doesn't have to think. You're looking at what God has made. It's all done. It's completed. It restores you. And I love to go for prayer walks out in the visual creation of God where we can just talk to him, see what he's made. It's not hard to praise him as we look upon his creation. Spend time in repenting, confessing sin, separating out those things that aren't pleasing from, to God, asking him for grace to repent and forsake. A, ask, ask God, whatever's on your heart, just ask him. And then why? Yielding, yielding to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you control my life today. Supplication is so important for us. I hope that you will commit to saying lifelong, I want a growing prayer life. I want to start to journal my prayer requests. And because if you're, well, many of you have great memories, but I find mine is so forgetful of God's blessings but that when I journal and I write down, put it in my computer, put it in a document and put down the date, the specific prayer request, and then the date and the answer, and then journal the things God's teaching me in my spiritual life. It helps me to focus on the greatness of God and many things that quickly fade from my mind that I forget to praise God for, it brings it back because God then reminds me he is faithful. He is steadfast. The fourth essential is steadfastness, steadfastness. And here's the picture back now in Psalm 1-3, if you'll look there with me, verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his leaf, or his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. Notice the picture here, a tree planted. This is steadfastness. It's a stable tree. It's not blown about. 
It's stable, it's strong. Jesus picked up on the same theme in John 15 where he talks about in verse 2 that every branch in me, our stability is in Christ. Uh, what's going to happen? He carries on through that whole passage in John 15 where he says, now you're clean through the word, abide in me and I in you. And he brings that theme over and over. Verse 5, abide in me. Verse 6, abide in me. If, you, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. You see, there's a steadfastness as we learn to look to Jesus, as we learn to depend upon Jesus, there's a steadfastness through a growing, intimate relationship with Jesus. That's what God wants for each of our lives. Peter picks up on the same theme. Second Peter chapter 1. Add to temperance, patience, or steadfastness. God wants us to become steadfast. Someone has said that steadfastness is enduring with vibrant hope. That's what God wants for us. Paul picks up the same theme in Romans 12, 2, that we will be transformed by the renewing of our mind. There will come a steadfastness in the way we think and in the way we view life. I can do all things through Christ, Paul said. Someone put it this way, you take care of the depth of your ministry and God will take care of the breadth of your ministry. Go deeper in your walk with God. Now, these are essentials. These first four essentials largely have to do with taking in. Now, the next three essentials focus on giving out. Some of you have seen pictures. Some of you have even visited the Dead Sea in Israel. And it's wonderful to see a great spiritual lesson there, that the Dead Sea has water flowing in, but nothing flowing out. And so it's filled with all these minerals and things, but nothing can grow there. There's no trees around it. It's dead because there's no outlet. Well, so it is in our spiritual life. Maintaining our soul, yes, we've got to take in, but we need to learn the balance of giving out. And so let's look at these next three essentials for a healthy soul. Giving out, how would God have us to do that? Well, the theme is picked up in Psalm 1 where it says he brings forth his fruit. The whole purpose for the root down is ultimately that there might be fruit up, fruit growing out. Jesus picks up on the theme when he says in John 15 that he wants us to bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit, fruit that will remain that the Father might be glorified. Jesus wants fruit from your life. You know, somebody pointed out to me, when you look at other people and say, you know, they're so gifted, I can see where God could use them. I don't think he could use me. I'm so weak, I don't have the ability so-and-so has or whatever. That that line of thinking is more of a reflection on your view of God than it is of you. Because anybody that God ever uses is a weak clay vessel, a sinner saved by grace. And to think that God couldn't use you as you surrender your life to God, a blood-bought, born-again child of God filled with his spirit, you are special to God. You are created in his image. And you are gifted by God to glorify God in the world. God desires to bring forth fruit, but not just a little fruit, more fruit and much fruit and fruit that remains. Why? That the Father be glorified. Not that we be glorified, but that he be glorified. And so this is the picture of Jesus here, growing fruitfulness. Now, in the Bible, we know that fruit is pictured at times in the Bible as praise to God, the praise of our lips. That's fruit. Fruit is also the fruit of the Spirit. Our character, growing in Christ-likeness. Fruit is also the fruit of giving. Fruit is also the fruit of good works. And also the fruit of souls saved. God wants to bear all these aspects and many more through your life and through mine. Jesus said it in John 15 too. Fruit and then more fruit. Verse, verse 5, much fruit. And then verse 8, much fruit. And then verse 16, fruit that remains. You know, long after your life is over on this earth, if by God's grace you live to his glory, there'll be fruit coming forth to God's glory on this earth and for eternity in heaven. John 15, 12 says, This is my command that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus has so loved us, and now he's teaching us with that same love to reach out to sacrificially touch the lives of others. Peter put it this way in the 2 Peter 1 passage. He said, and add 
God, uh, to godliness, brotherly kindness or affection, and to brotherly kindness, charity or love. So what's the evidence of a growing Christian? Your life is becoming more and more God-centered and other-centered. You are learning to love God, and you're learning to love others. And it's not a fleshly thing. It's something that God is teaching you. Paul, in Romans, picks up the same theme, where the gifts are all there for one another and for God's glory, exercised by grace. And Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 13 that he purposed to come there to Rome so that he might bear some fruit among them. Now, what was the fruit he was talking about? He's talking about the fruit of souls. He wanted to go to a major metropolitan area where he could lead people to Jesus, but he also wanted the fruit of encouraging Christians and strengthening those believers who were already there. The fruit of impacting other lives for Christ. That's the fruit God wants to bring forth in all of our lives. As we think about the essentials, let's go to the sixth one. Soul building. Soul building. You see, the Psalms passage talks about fruit. But the New Testament fleshes that out. Christ's plan in John 15 is this growing intimacy with Jesus where we're so abiding in him that now we are bearing more and more fruit. Fruit that remains to the glory of God. We're seeing people saved. We're seeing people come to know Christ as their savior. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to impact others for Christ. Soul winning, where we touch other lives to receive Jesus. Paul went in and he said, I want to have fruit among you. I want to lead people to Christ. That ought to be our heart's desire is to lead others to Christ, to so grow in the reality of our relationship with Jesus that we're able to influence others to repent and believe the gospel. I recently read a statistic that of professing Christians, 98% of professing Christians never in their lifetime lead one person to faith in Christ. You know, by God's grace, we need to pray, God, help us. Help us during the course of our life we don't save anyone. God saves them. But help us to be faithful witnesses. And God, give us the privilege of leading other people to know Jesus as their Savior. Soul winning is an essential for Christian growth and maturity. But then soul building. What do we do with those folks that trust Christ as Savior? Well, we're to influence them to grow in their faith. I think of the fact that the fruit spoken of in Psalms there and by Jesus in John 15, it's fleshed out by Peter when he says that we add this brotherly kindness and this love where we really care about other people. You know, we're challenged when we live at home. How about starting at home? Well, how about our roommates? Do we care about the spiritual growth of our roommates that we really want to see them make it spiritually? I hope we do. I hope we're praying for each other. We're trying to help each other. Matthew, Jesus said, go and make disciples that we're influencing others who have received Christ to see them become growing Christians who are able to maintain their own soul. Paul put it this way to Timothy. He said, the things you've learned, you teach others. You commit to faithful men. Who's on your prayer list that you're praying for? To see them grow spiritually. Get a list. People in your prayer group, people in your dorm, people in your society people you know and love, that you say, I pray for you. I pray by name for you. I want to see you grow. I want to see you be all that God wants you to be. And then that brings us to a seventh essential, and that's service. That is where we're using our gifts. This fruit that Psalm speaks about, this fruit that Jesus speaks about in John 15, that Peter fleshes out as being unselfish agape love for others and for God and brotherly kindness, this love for others will cause us to begin to serve God. Paul describes it this way in the Romans 12 passage. He says that if we present our bodies a living sacrifice, we're not conformed to this world, we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, then we will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God and that this is our reasonable service. And so I love the concept of every Christian called to serve. Every Christian. Every Christian in the place where we are, serving God. That is, everything I do daily is an act of worship. I can do it as unto the Lord. And therefore, there's nothing mundane. My studies, 
my homework, my exams, everything can be done in the flesh just to get it done, or it can be done in the spirit to the glory of God. And then it takes on an, uh, an act of worship that my whole life is that living sacrifice. And yes, we know in our humanness, living sacrifices tend to crawl off the altar. And we have to come back and confess sin and reaffirm that surrender of our life to God daily. But that's God's plan. He wants us to let our life so become an act of worship that everything we think and say and do is an act of worship, bringing glory back to God. Having a servant's heart, willing to serve God and others, not because we have to, but because we want to. And you know what? There is joy in serving Jesus. Jesus, others, you, J-O-Y, putting Christ first, learning to die to ourself, doesn't make any sense, but Jesus said it. He who keeps his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Have a servant's heart. Be willing to serve God. Be willing to serve in your school. Be willing to serve on the weekends. Serve God. Be active. Now, what will these seven essentials produce? They produce the eighth thing, and that's success. Psalm 1-3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. What a promise. What a fantastic promise that God says, if I will follow his pattern for maintaining my soul, he'll put his blessing on my life. He will so lead me that if I'm off on the wrong track, he'll bring me back on the right track. And whatever I do, to his glory and in his strength will prosper. Oh God, I want that in my life, don't you? I want that in my life. I want God's blessing. And he promises it here at the end of this list of essentials for maintaining our soul. Jesus carries on the same theme, John 15. He says, you haven't chosen me, but I've chosen you. And I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. God's success, a lasting legacy to God's glory, a lifetime of answered prayer. Jesus promises it to every believer who will abide in Jesus. Peter carries the same theme. He says in 2 Peter 1, that if we do these things, if we diligently add to our faith these essentials, you shall never fail. So an entrance, verse 11, shall be ministered unto you abundantly or richly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here it is, God's promise of success. Your life won't be worthless. It won't be meaningless. God will bless your life, and you'll have an abundant entrance into God's heaven. Paul picks up the same theme when he says that our life will be an acceptable sacrifice to God, and it will be good. It will be acceptable. Here it is then. Number one, understand God's plan for success. Not because I said it. Dig it out of the scriptures yourself. As you meditate in the Psalms, in the New Testament, in the words of Jesus, dig it out. Find these essentials as these themes flow over and over in scripture. Remember, David, who wrote Psalm 23, had a heart for God. And yet he got his eyes off Jesus. He got his eyes off God as an Old Testament believer. And his sin with Bathsheba, was it forgiven? Yes, he repented and confessed. But oh, the price he paid, the effect that had on his life, on the kingdom of, of Israel, and on his children, and on his family. At one point in his life, he got his eyes off God, and he failed to maintain his soul, and all the consequences that he grieved over till the day he died. Don't let it happen in your life. Maintain your soul. Maintain your soul by God's grace for a lifetime. By God's grace, number two, by faith, do your part. It really boils down to, like the song, trust and obey. You can put those essentials down into that. Trust God, live your life God's way, and obey God. Do what he said. And then finally, as you do your part, and that emphasis is all through the scripture, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you, Jesus said in John 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another. A friend who lays down his life for his friends. 
Maintain your soul. Do your part, but then trust God to do his part. You see, there are things only God can do, but he promises to do them. Go through that John 15 passage and lay hold of the promises of God that comes to the person who seeks biblically to maintain their soul on a daily basis. What is God's promise? He promises joy. He says, I wrote these things to you that my joy might be in you and your joy might be full. We don't have to go through life without joy. God wants us to have joy. He promises, I've spoken these things to you not as a servant, but as my friends. A growing friendship with Jesus. He's our master, yes, but he becomes our friend. A growing fruitfulness in your life where you do see God using your life to his glory. Not that you can take any claim, but so he gets glory. Your life is fulfilled in him. You're bearing fruit. A growing love for God. A growing love for other people. An abundant entrance into heaven. These are the promises of God. Maintaining your soul. That's something that God has promised you the ability to do. It's contingent on your obedience and your faith. It's your choice daily to keep in view God's game plan out of his holy scripture, the owner's manual. He promises success. Here would be my challenge to us as we look at this theme of maintaining our soul. Pick one or two areas in your life of the intake where you need to go deeper. What's an area where you need to go deeper in taking in? Is it the separation area where you've been compromising? There's some things you look at, you think about that you know are not pleasing to God. They need to be put out of your life. Is it the area of saturation? Your Bible reading is just to get it done, but it's not meaningful. Is it the prayer life? Is it the steadfastness? Pick one or two of these areas of taking in and say, God, I want to go deeper. And then pick one or two areas in this focus on giving out. Is it in the area of your witness and your soul winning that you really are not a, a actively seeking to be obedient to share the gospel? Take a step in that. How about your soul building, helping others to grow? How about your service for God? Pick one or two areas in your intake, one or two areas in your outflow, and say, God, today, I want to do business with you. I want to go out of this place with a game plan of how I can better maintain my soul so that I can be a blessing to others. I read a little story, a true account from a man who'd been in spiritual ministry for years. And he was actually a writer, an author, a, a leader of others. But he said one day, though he was doing the right things, he saw a little sports car pull up next to him and when it pulled away, his heart went with it. And he was just facing some internal temptations and struggles that he hadn't dealt with over the years. And he was kind of questioning, I, I, I think I'm doing the right things, and yet what's going on inside of me? What's going on here? And so he wisely went to an older, uh, godly, proven Christian, and he said, here's what's going on in my life. Give me your counsel. And this older senior pastor said to him, he said, you know what, you're at a, you're at a crucial time right now in your life. Because when you first started out in ministry, your life was like a scale. And on the scale, you had no experience. You were light on experience. And therefore, you knew you had to depend on God. You were heavy in dependence on God. Your prayer life, your digging into the scripture, you knew you weren't going to make it if God didn't do it. But now as the years have gone on, that scale started to level out. You know what to do. You know how to handle those situations. You know which way to go. He said, you're at a crucial time right now. You're going to really mess up in your life unless you choose to go back deeper in your dependence on God. And he wisely sorted that through, and he says, you know, it's true. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm doing the right things. But I've started to just depend upon myself and my experience. And I'm at a turning point in my life. I've got to go deeper with God. And he began to pray over and say, Lord, how do you want me to go deeper with God? And the Holy Spirit has a wonderful way of being very specific with us when we get serious with God. And God laid on this man's heart. He says, you know what? I've been reading my Bible, but I need, a, I need 
to give a, a more quality time with God daily. And so he began to get up even a little bit earlier. And I always encourage people, first thing if you can, but if not, then the first discretionary time in the day, get alone with God, get alone with God. This man deepened his alone time with God. He also started journaling. He'd been reading and praying, but journaling was something he felt like would help him become more intentional. And he began then to journal and deepen his prayer life and deepen his time in the Word of God. And he came back and shared, you know what? That was a crucial time in my life. But by good counsel and God's grace, he said, I did determine I'm going to go deeper with God. And he did go deeper in his dependence on God. And in his, as his dependence on God got stronger and stronger, he began to see even greater fruitfulness in his life than he'd ever seen before. And young people and guests today, my challenge is to all of us, to my heart and to yours, let's go deeper in our walk with God. Let's learn to depend upon him more that he may bring forth more fruit through our lives to his glory. Let's pray and ask God to do that right now, shall we? Will you bow for prayer with me?